Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt? Lord, they're not mine, they're yours. I couldn't handle them. You're the one to deal with them. And then he says in verse 12, and I want you to notice his supreme concern was for God's glory. He said, why should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. And then he reminded God of his promises and his covenant. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. See, Moses was concerned for God's reputation. He said, God, if you bring these people out and then they perish in the mountains, the Egyptians will say, well, you had an evil intention against them when you brought them out. And if you look in another place where Moses made similar intercession without going into the background, in Numbers, the 14th chapter, God, Moses talked to God in the similar way. Again, Israel were into trouble and Moses was making intercession. We won't go into the background of this. It's a similar but a different incident. Um, Numbers 14, 11. The Lord said unto Moses, How long will this people provoke me? And how long will it be ere they believe me for all the signs which I've showed among them? The problem here was their refusal to enter the promised land. They believed the ten spies with the negative report rather than the two spies with the positive report. And God was so angry with their unbelief, he said, let me deal with them. And I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. God said, you see, Moses, I can still keep my promise and you'll be the one who will be the ancestor of this great nation. And Moses said unto the Lord, we're in Numbers 14, verse 13, Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou, hast, for thou broughtest up thy people in thy might from among the Egyptians, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, and that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he swear unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. You see, Moses said, God, you've got to be careful because your reputation will suffer. People will conclude that you could get them out of Egypt, but you couldn't get them into the land. So in order to dispose of your problem, you just kill them on the mountains. God, we can't have that, he said. And then he said, and now, Lord, I beseech thee. Well, we don't need to go further with that. But you see, Moses was totally unconcerned about his personal reputation or stature. He was only concerned about God's glory and reputation in the earth. Now, going back to Exodus 32 for a moment, just look at the closing part of that chapter, and this is the consummation of Moses' intercession. Moses went down to the bottom of the mountain, dealt with the people, and then came up again. In Exodus 32, beginning at verse 30, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned a great sin, and now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, O oh, this people have sinned the great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. That's intercession. God, they deserve your stroke. Forgive them. But if not, Lord, let their judgment come upon me. The intercessor is the one who stands in between God and the objects of his just wrath. And this is summed up in Psalm 106, which is a divine commentary on this incident. Psalm 106.
We just read a few verses there. This describes the incident when Israel made the golden calf. Psalm 106 verse 19. They made a calf in Horeb and worshipped the molten image. Thus they changed their glory into the similitude of an ox that eateth grass. They forgat God their saviour which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore he, that is God, said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. That's the position of the intercessor. He's the one who stands before God in the breach made by the sin of God's people and says, Lord, I'm stopping the gap. Your blow can't fall upon them unless it first falls upon me. And then in Numbers again, we'll find one other picture of intercession which is very beautiful and very vivid. It's in Numbers chapter 16. It's Moses and Aaron together who are the intercessors this time. Um, they had been sin and rebellion by Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And God had sovereignly dealt with the rebels. He'd caused the earth to open and swallow them alive. And this had caused a tremendous fear amongst Israel. But the next day the rest of the people turned against Moses and Aaron and said, you've killed the people of the Lord. Which is one of the most ridiculous things you could think of, as if, as if either Moses or Aaron could cause the earth to open and swallow them up. But you see, they had a, an evil, critical, rebellious heart. When I think of all the criticism that Moses endured, I marvel at the patience of that man. He certainly was the meekest man on earth, as the scriptures say. So we read now the aftermath of this, Numbers 16, beginning at verse 14. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. And it came to pass, when the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron, that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation, and behold, the cloud covered it, and the glory of the Lord appeared. God intervened visibly. His personal presence came down upon the sea. And Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Again, that's the position of the intercessor, prostrate on his face before God, knowing that judgment is just about to fall. God, stay your hand. And I marvel at their grace because the people had turned against them without any good reason. And for those who had criticized them, they offered intercession. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire thereon from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly unto the congregation and make an atonement for them for there is wrath gone out from the Lord the plague is begun God's judgment was already coming upon the people in the form of a plague that killed them almost instantly and Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation and behold the plague was begun among the people and he put on incense and made an atonement for the people and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stayed. It stopped where he stood. Now it's my supposition that that plague was highly infectious. It was transmitted from one to another. It had already begun as a divine judgment on God's people. And Moses knew it, presumably by the word of knowledge. He said, Aaron, quickly, grab your censer. Put on fire, put incense on the top of the coals and run, not walk, but run to where the plague is smiting the people. And Aaron ran with his censer in his hand to the place where the last man had just died, took his stand beside that dying or dead man between him and the one who would die next. Now if I'm right and it was an infectious disease, Aaron deliberately exposed himself to that contagion. He risked his own life. Standing there he swung the censer and as he swung it 
the beautiful white fragrant smoke rose up in a white line and divided between the dead and the living. And where that white smoke went up from the censer, the plague stopped. That's intercession. It's coming between the dead and those who are due to die at the risk of your own life, standing there and offering up fervent prayer and supplication like that white smoke from the censer. And where that rises up acceptable to God, the plague stays. Finally, I want to look at another picture in Ezekiel chapter 22. But this is a different scene for one reason. Not, I believe, that the sins of God's people were worse, except in this respect that amongst all those religious pre people, and we know from the context that there were prophets and priests, God could not find one intercessor. And because he could not find one intercessor, he could no longer withhold his wrath and his judgment. I want you to look at this picture that begins in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 23. Ezekiel 22, 23. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, that's the land of Israel, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. I always remember one of my African students, his name was Wilson Mambaleo, and he is a man who understands intercession. He is one of the most outstanding intercessors that I've ever met, a young African student in Kenya. And I remember his pointing out to me one day, he said, Brother Prince, he probably called me Mr. Prince in those days, he said, the only thing that can cleanse a wicked land is the rain of God's Holy Spirit. And if the rain doesn't fall, the land will not be cleansed. Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. And then there comes a long chronicle of the failures of every section of the people. And there's not one single group that's excluded. Interestingly enough, in English, every group that's specified begins with a letter P, which makes it perhaps a little easier to remember. If you look in verse 25, there is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof. We don't need to read further. Verse 26, her priests have violated the law. Verse 27, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. Then verse 28, we go back to the prophets again. The prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. And finally, in verse 29, the people of the land, the common people, have used oppression and exercised robbery. The list is prophets, priests, princes, and people. And I think it's significant where the problem begins. It begins with the prophets. When the prophets are no longer faithful to the oracle of God, then corruption sets in. I'm deeply impressed when I think about this, about the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. Essentially, they were living in a nation that was backslidden with its rulers. And the real protection of God's people Israel at that time was manifested in critical moments as chariots and horsemen of fire. And if you read the account, you'll find that when the chariots and the horsemen of fire appeared, they did not center around the kings or the secular rulers but they were always around the prophet, Elijah or Elisha. And you know, I, I don't know whether this sounds arrogant, but the highest that I can think of is this for myself. I'd like to be the kind of person that attracts the chariots and horsemen of fire. 
And the real protection of God's people then was not in their rulers, nor in their armies, nor in their generals. Their protection was in one man who lived such a life that God's chariots and horsemen of fire centered around him. But when the prophets fail, then that's the beginning of total corruption. There's no longer a clear, up-to-date, relevant message from God. Next, the failure is amongst the priests those that lead religious practice. The prophets, then the priest, priests, then the princes, the secular rulers, and finally the whole people. Corruption starts from the spiritual and works downward. This is true in America. When there's no prophet, when there's no voice from God, then religion becomes formal and unreal and insincere. The priests fail. And when the prophets and the priests fail, it's reflected in the failure of the secular rulers. When you look at Watergate and all that's involved, bear in mind that reflects the failure of the prophets and the priests. We see it in the princes, but it doesn't start there. And then it affects the whole people. And here was a nation that was totally corrupt before God. And now look at what God says about them. In Ezekiel 32, 22, concluding verses 30 and 31. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. Verse 30, God says, I sought for a man, one man. That would be an intercessor. The picture is very vivid. Stand in the gap and make up the hedge. And the implication is clear. God says, if I could have found one man, I could have spared the whole nation. But because I couldn't find one, he says, therefore, I have poured out upon them my indignation, consumed them in the fire of my wrath. One man who would take the place of an intercessor could have saved an entire nation from final judgment. Isn't that true today? Isn't that the situation of the United States? Surely this nation is overripe for divine judgment. The Bible reveals one clear principle of God that judgment is according to the light that has been granted to us. Jesus said, Woe unto thee, Chorazin! Woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in thee, had been, which were done in thee had been done in Tyre and Sodom, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have stood unto this day. Woe unto thee, Capernaum, for if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have remained unto this day. Judgment is according to light. The greater the light available, the severer the judgment for rejecting that light. And I would say, objectively, in all the history of the human race, there has never been a generation on the face of the earth that has had greater spiritual light made available to it than this generation in the United States today. If judgment falls upon us, it will be according to the light that we've received. When you consider the way God's Spirit is being poured out upon people who know nothing about it, don't even ask for it. When you consider the media by which the truth is being spread, television, radio, tapes, books, I don't believe there ever has been a generation anywhere in the history of the human race that has had light more readily available to it than this. If we fail, God help us. I don't know any way to measure the severity of the judgment that will come upon us.
God said, I sought for a man. I'm not looking for a committee. I'm not looking for a church board. I'm not looking for a visitation program. They all have their place. But he said, I am looking for a man. I like the word man. There's something powerful about the English word man. It always blesses me when Pontius Pilate had to bring Jesus out and say, Behold the man. And that's what he was. He was the man. He was what every man ought to have been. And only he was. How about it? Are you willing? Would you consider the responsibility of offering yourself to God as an intercessor? As I close my message, I just want to bring to you four qualifications that I see in every scriptural intercessor which I think are self-evident, really, when you consider the cases that we've looked at. First of all, an intercessor must have an absolute conviction of God's righteousness, like Abraham. God, could you bring judgment upon the righteous that is due only to the wicked? But he must be absolutely convinced also that God will judge the wicked. There's no kind of milk and water religion about God is too kind to judge anybody. Anybody who talks or thinks like that cannot qualify to be an intercessor. An intercessor has to have a crystal clear vision of the absolute justice and inevitability of God's judgment. Secondly, he has to have a deep concern for God's glory. Like Moses, who twice turned down the offer to be the ancestor of the greatest people on earth, said, God, it wouldn't be for your glory. What would the Egyptians say? What would the people of the land say? They'd say, you couldn't do it, God, that you took on something that was too difficult for you when you said you'd get that nation out of Egypt and into Canaan. God, your glory would suffer. Thirdly, I believe such a person must have an intimate acquaintance with God. A person that can stand before God and talk to God with the utmost frankness. And yet, I believe, reverence. And finally, to be an intercessor takes holy boldness. You've got to risk your life. You've got to be like Aaron and say, well, I'll run the risk of the plague, but I'm going to stand here. Four years ago, I became an American citizen. I became one by choice. And believe me, friends, I weighed that decision very carefully. Because I believe when I became a citizen of the United States, I identified myself with this nation for good or for evil. And I could see the tremendous possibility of a divine judgment falling on this nation. I was not blind to it. But God had spoken to me audibly in 1953, when I was still a pastor in England. This is what he said. He said, there shall be a great revival in the United States and Great Britain. And I'm willing to run the risk because I believe that great revival is coming if God can find intercessors. I believe we can stay the judgment of God and call down the mercy and grace and blessing of God if we learn to intercede. I'd like everybody just to be bowed quietly in prayer for a moment. And I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I don't want anybody to do anything by a carnal impulse or under the impulse of emotion. But I want to ask one question. Are there those of you here this morning who would say, God, if you can make an intercessor out of me, I'm willing to pay the price. Sit there a moment and just meditate on that. Quietly consider it. And then if you feel that this is a divine prompting to you from the Holy Spirit, if you want to indicate your acceptance, just quietly stand to your feet wherever you are. You remember what I said? God 
if you can make an intercessor out of me, I'm willing to pay the price. I'm not looking for great numbers and I don't want an emotional response. Don't do it. There, there are other ministries, there are other callings. Not everybody in this sense is necessarily called to be an intercessor. But we certainly need some. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Just a moment longer. Let me tell you, there is no higher calling. When you are an intercessor, you've reached the throne. Man may not see you because you'll be out of sight beyond the second veil. But your life will count for God for time and for eternity. I would stop, but people are still standing, more and more. And I don't want to cut anything off, because this is too precious. Please count the cost. Remember, it's between you and God. You may not be an intercessor now, but if you offer yourself, God will deal with you. And it may be a hard dealing. Some of the lessons that I've shared with you this morning, I've learned in a hard way. I've been through some bitter things. But as I look back, I thank God even for the bitter places. All right, I'm going to pray now for you that are standing. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I thank thee for every one of your children that has stood before you saying, God, if you can make an intercessor out of me, I'm willing to pay the price. Bless each one, Lord. I commit each one specifically to you and pray that with your hand laid upon them you'll lead them in the paths of discipline and instruction that will make them what they've offered to be for your glory in Jesus name and all God's people said Amen. Amen. God bless you. For further information and a resource guide containing all audio and video cassettes and books please contact Derek Prince Ministries Box 19501, Department T, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28219.